um, so the, the, one of the, the mega themes, obviously, in Philippians is joy. But the other mega theme is that of unity. And we've, mm-hmm. we've already seen it start to unfold, and it gets more so as we go along. And it's unity that is connected with what? What's the theme that goes hand in hand with it all, all the way through? Yeah. Humility. Um, so it's this united theme of, of unity connected with, with, with humility. And so both of them are, 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 are spiritual gifts, the, the Spirit's gifts to us as a church. Um, he, God's joy and God's unity and humility. And, and you know, they, they're not necessarily the gifts that we think we want necessarily always joy maybe but again in the concept of how he's unpacking joy not really sure this is the joy we, we always think we want or we need um and unity and humility is when we're going mm, you know do we really need that and god's going no actually that that is is something i want to give you as a, as a fruit because i want to see this bear um in your lives and in in the church um, as a whole um, and so, so those are the, the mega themes. And then we, we, we spoke about how Paul gets to the place where he goes, okay, now to explain joy, but in the context of unity and humility, I'm going to give you the perfect example, and he does what? He gives us the Christology of Jesus. He says that the best example I can give you, and he, we use that word Christology, but he, he tells us who Jesus was. And he says, the best example of humility I can give you, and unity, in fact, as well, we'll see it unpacked, is Jesus. And so he gives us this, this beautiful New Testament breaking down of who Jesus is, the Christology of Jesus. And we looked last time at the seven steps of, of Christ's seven steps from the throne to the cross, of, of, of him humbling himself and coming down. And then this week, we're going to look at the seven steps of, of, of the exalted and glorified Christ from the cross to the throne. So that's what we're going to look at this week. But just to recap, let's go through the seven steps because it's important. Remember, again, these were Jesus' steps, but because Paul's saying, as a model, I want you to be humble and to live in unity and in humility, and this is your example. So as much as this is about to Jesus, the dynamic here is Jesus, this is who Jesus is, so model it. Um, I put a, a, a verse, uh, you got the section we're going to read today in the TPT and the NIV, but then um, just towards the end of the page, that 1 John 2 verse 6, that verse I, I ended off last week, or the last time we did this, um, and, and this verse is, is one of my favorite, but it says, whoever claims to live in him, to live in Jesus, must walk as Jesus did. And so that's what Paul's going, he's going, if you want to live in humility, then you need to walk out as Jesus walked out humility because he's the perfect example of humility. So that this is the, the, the invitation that we get invited into. If you want to, if you claim to be in him, then we need to be modeling him. He, he is the perfect model. He came to earth as man for us to live a life as a man. Again, not to prove anything to himself, but to show us how to live as, as, as a spirit-filled man, how to live out our lives on earth. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Are you everybody with me? Any comments? Are we good? Okay, if I'm going too fast, whatever. But let's try and go through those seven steps that we did that we did last time. Um, so the first one, the seven steps. This is from the from the throne. Remember that he, he he Christ was in heaven from the from the beginning, wherever that is, um, for all of eternity. Christ was on the throne. So it was the, the triune God was was on the throne, and then he comes and he steps down and um, to come into earth into the cross. So step number one. Anybody remember what step number one was? <coughs> he emptied himself. Remember, Jesus emptied himself um, and that he poured out and he divested himself of those outward robes of glory and he took on the rags of humanity. So he emptied himself. He, not, he didn't stop becoming, he didn't stop being God, but he emptied himself of that outward glory um, and all that that meant. Um, so that was number one. Number two, he became a servant. <coughs> um, and remember, that whole thing of the master of the universe comes and, and he became a servant to all. He was, he, he, in Jesus' life, he served. Very seldom did anybody serve him. He was the one that came and served. Again, examples to us about emptying ourselves, about being a servant. Number three is he became human in human likeness. And, and this hum, humanity is, is the big crux here. He, take, he took on humanity. He became a human. But that was a permanent union with mankind. He didn't give up being a human again. He, he went from the Son of God to the God-man. 
and that's and, and that still stands today i'm going to unpack that more as we go along so he took on humanity as a continual thing jesus became a man and he still is eternally god and eternally morphed into a human human being god became a man forever and he's never going to let let go of his body and go back to being the, god the son without the body and that's important for us. And remember, we, we remember we, we did we, we mentioned some of those things of marriage, how he, he did that so that we could be equally yoked, so that we could be his bride, that we could he could identify with us, and that we could be one with him. We, we touched on some of those things in in the in the past. Okay, number four was he humbled himself. He didn't demand worship, and 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 the whole thing of that he served as well. Number five was he was revealed as a vulnerable man, and we said that whole thing of vulnerability. He came and he 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 made himself so that he could die, that that he could that he literally could thirst, that he could hunger, that he needed sleep, that he needed companionship, that he had emotional needs, and all of this so that he could be pierced, yes. so that he could die. He made himself vulnerable because because he's God. And, and, and he had to make himself vulnerable enough to be pierced and die on the cross. So um, that vulnerability as a man was number five. Um, number six was he was obedient. He was obedient. Remember we said that uh, he saw what the father was doing, he heard what the father was saying, and he did it. He was completely obedient um, to everything the father told him, even obedient to death. And it was because of his obedience that, that we have eternal life and so that that obedience is a huge thing um, and it still is in our lives and he went all the way um, to the end as the obedient son and number seven was he was crucified on the cross he was crucified that he died the most despicable degrading death ever contrived and, and scripture says that cursed is the man um, who, 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 is, who is crucified and so he bore our curse and that was the picture of the cross um, that his death has made us alive the cross became in essence the portal to our eternity um, and it becomes the gateway into our eternal life. Everybody good? Yeah. So we have those steps, the seven steps where he, he, he stepped down. And remember we said the Zacchaeus thing of Jesus says, to, 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 to come into God's will is to come and to come humbly, to step down. Um, to come closer to him is, is to humble ourselves. And so those are the, the seven steps that we look at. Okay, let's, let's have a look at, um, we're going to read from verse 9. And it says, because of, the, of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the name above all names. Now, <laughs> there's a concept here that we need to understand. He was on the throne. Yes, he was God. He, he, he was worshipped for all of eternity. Then he steps down and he comes to the cross. Now this verse says, and God exalted and multiplied his greatness. The greatness that he is going to receive now going back to the throne is very different and greater than what he had, which is a little bit mind-blowing. You think, well, God, how can your greatness be greater than great? Do you know what I'm getting at? I mean, he was God, he was on the throne, he's going back to be God on the throne, but, he, but, he, but the scripture says, no, no, but this is a very different way of being great. God exalted him in, in, in greater and bigger ways. And I, we, before we do the seven steps, I just want us to look at five of these ways that, that this greatness came through. Um, and so, if you don't mind, we, we're going to do that quickly. Number one was first in his resurrection. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, but unlike any other person. Give me some names in scripture of people who were raised from the dead. Jesus wasn't the only one. Lazarus. Lazarus. But to live on earth. Yep. And, and that meant that Lazarus eventually, he would have died. Yeah. Okay. Somebody else who was raised from the dead in scripture. He was a little girl. Yep. Jair Jairus' daughter. Remember? And same thing, she was raised from the dead, but she would have died. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus' is resurrection is very different. And, and there's a, a verse, I've put it in, I think I gave it to you in Ephesians. Um, it's across the, the next page. It says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead? God had to use this immeasurable greatness of his power and his great might. To raise Christ from the dead. That term is never used with Lazarus or Jairus' daughter or anybody else. Never. Why? Why was Jesus' resurrection so different? And this is important to understand the, this exaltation thing. Um, Jesus is, it was different because who was raised when Jesus was raised? So his resurrection wasn't a resurrection of one man and then to die again. His resurrection was for all. 
whoever received Jesus in the past or future, for everybody eternally. So you understand that his resurrection is very different to, to the ones that we see in very good. And hence why it, it required this, this inordinate power of God, the greatness, this great power of God to, to work in it. Because his resurrection was, he, in essence, Jesus' resurrection was birthing a new species. Think about it. Before Jesus' resurrection, there was no new creation. There wasn't. There was talk of a new creation, but in essence, there was no new creation. Only after Jesus' resurrection do we, are we able, because don't forget, we are, yes, we were, we were co-buried with Christ, but we, we were co-risen with Christ. So we are, we, we, we are in his resurrection. When he rose, we received resurrection life. Yeah? Scripture speaks about the first fruit of resurrection. Yes. And that's Jesus. That's him. He's the first fruit of and then we are all part of that. Exactly. Hence being first is the rest. And so, yeah. so his resurrection, in, in, in his exaltation, yeah. all of these things, they were bigger than they were before because suddenly it didn't include him only. It included all of us. So the greatness of his resurrection wasn't that he was resurrected, which was great in itself, but that we were resurrected because of his resurrection. Hence why it was so much greater. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so then keeping some of those things in mind, let's go to the next one. So in this exhortation, it was in the resurrection that Jesus was raised and raised again. Um, and then we have, um, sorry, I'm finding pages again. Uh, the next one is God exalted him and multiplied his greatness through the different, the next one is the ascension, which we're going to be looking at next Thursday. Um, and he ascended up into heaven in Acts 1. Um, you can go and read about his ascension. I've given you the verse there, verse 9. It says, Acts 1, verse 9 says, After this, he was taken up into a cloud, not on a cloud, not in a cloud, but into a cloud. Very important words. That's the original words there. While they were watching and no longer come. And he will come um, in the same way that he left. He will come out of a cloud. And we, we did some of this with Revelation. Do you remember the context of this, of the ascension? Of his ascension was, was he ascended into the cloud, a great cloud of witnesses, into his people. His ascension was, 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 was into and carrying us in that ascension. Because remember then we become seated with him in heavenly places. So again, his ascension wasn't just his ascension, it was oh. our ascension. Did you understand why all of these things are suddenly different? Because he's, as, he's coming as God-man, his resurrection was his and ours. His ascension is his and ours. Um, the next one, and, and I'm not going to, I don't have time to pack, unpack the whole of ascension. We, we can do that some other time. Um, the next one, so he was resurrected, he was ascended, and then it, there was the coronation. And I, when I was doing the study, it was before the coronation, um, but just, just thinking of, we're going to get to see this, and some of you watched it. But the coronation of Christ, that Jesus was crowned as king, as a human being. This had never happened. He was crowned. Yes, he was crowned and on, enthroned before, but this time he was, in, he was crowned and enthroned as the Son of Man, as God-Man. We, we are crowned with him. We are co-rulers with him. So even his coronation wasn't just his, but was ours. And that we, we eventually get to meet her out and to, to, to live in and, and live from. But again, as we said last time, he has already won all these things for us. Again, well, there's, a, there's an invitation for us to live in this and to, be, you know, to, to work this out. Yes, definitely. But, but as it stands, we are represented in that. Does that make sense? So we share everything. <laughs> there is nothing Jesus has that we don't. <laughs> it, just, it just makes your brain go a little bit. Um, but it's, it's really important, and we, as I said, we're going to unpack it slowly, but, but the, the, do you understand why this time around, this, this glorification looks so di much different than the glory that he had? This is, this is you know, this is, this is why it goes, it's, it's, it's you know, glory 2.0. <laughs> it, it's the more than. And you think, how could he get more? But he, it was more because suddenly it wasn't just him. Everything was him a, 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 representing us as well, hmm. that we are one in him. Um, and so God, uh, here, 
it's, it's an amazing thing to ponder what it means that a man rules the universe. It, it just blows my brain. Jesus Christ was crowned and he took the throne and was crowned king of the universe as a human being. There's a human being on the throne and God has raised up a man, Jesus Christ, the God man. He raised him up, he raised him up to the highest place and now a human being has been given all authority to govern the cosmos. And he's bringing a bride to, with, on his side. And he's bringing up people to be rulers with him, to be co-rulers and to be co-signers of the, the title deed of the universe. We are joint heirs of all things. That's that first fruits that you're talking about. Um, there's nothing that Christ has that you don't have because we are wrapped into him. And those of you who can way back think to Ephesians, that was the whole thing of Ephesians is that we are in him. We are wrapped into him. Um... So God, so God is, is exalting a man to govern the universe. And the implications um, is, is just astounding. Um, God's plan from the beginning is to put a man on the throne. The Trinity, and listen, the Trinity was self-sufficient. The Trinity didn't need anything. And yet, somewhere in the plans of eternity, they chose it wasn't a quickly default, let's do this. This was planned before the beginning of time. God planned for man to be on the throne with him. There are many questions I'd, I'd love to ask God one day. Um, and and he, he, his plan was that the, they would, ex be, that would exalt a people and bring them, that that's the, he determined from the Father, that he would exalt a people and bring them, as it were, right inside the mutuality of the kingdom of the Trinity. And, and, and again, all of this is, it, it feels sacrilegious to say, but you can't read scripture and not see this. We are in Christ. He is in us. We are one in them. We have been brought into the mutuality, mutuality of the Trinity. We are entwined with Christ. Hence why where we were and where we are now is so different. In, in the ancient fathers in the church, the word that they used for this is perichoresis. Anybody ever heard that word? Um, it's, it's wrapped into or entwined in Christ, um, wrapped around with God, and that he's wrapped himself around you. Peri meaning around, and choresis is, is where we get the word chorus or choreography, um, wrapped around him, that, that God is, is entwining us, is, 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 is wrapping himself around us, singing and dancing and choreography, but in the concept of bringing us into the middle. God has included us in the Trinity. So before your brain goes into whatever, um, let's look at some verses. I want us to go to some verses and let's look at some verses and, and ponder them. Song of Songs, 6 verse 3. Jesus is saying, I am, she, she says of, of, of her, her prince, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. The bridegroom and the bride. Um, in Galatians 2.20 underneath it says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Joshua 6, verse 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. Do you see this picture of being entwined? 1 Corinthians 6.17, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit or in the spirit, is one with him. So I, I am one, look at these verses, those first verses were, I am one with Jesus, I am entwined with Jesus. Then this next verse, 1 Corinthians, I am one in the Spirit. I, I am entwined with the Holy Spirit. I am one with Him in Spirit, in His Spirit. John 14, on the next page, um, it says, um, Have you not seen, this is um, we are, the whole concept of being one with the Father. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? And we've already established that Jesus is entwined in us. Okay, go on to the next verse uh, underneath that, John 14, 20. He says, in that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Hello, intertwined. My Father will love them, and he will come to them and make it our home, 
our home, the Trinity, that's the word for the Trinity, our home with them. That's the John 14, 23. So there's this concept of we are entwined with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are one in them, which makes us want to run for the hills. I get that. <laughs> because what that carries is huge. But, 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 but maybe God's going, can we not run away from it? Can you see it as the invitation that it is meant to be? Because with that, he, he has equipped us with the plan for the, for the saving of the world. Yeah? Okay, once again, very quiet today. <laughs> um, so, it's just so mind-boggling, because sometimes we just, you know, come across as just beggars. Yeah. You know? Completely. Yeah. This just worries me. <laughs> you know, we, 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 that's, I, I get that. And that's, that's the way we live. And yet the invitation of God's going, but, but that's not who you are. You are a new creation. You are intertwined in me. Remember, we even did that Isaiah 40 verse where it, that, 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 uh, that strength in yourself in the Lord is, is entwined in the Godhead. God's like, your strength is me in you. Anything, I'm going to get to that just now, but anything that is ours is, is, is borrowed. What in your life is not borrowed from God? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but in the opposite word of that, absolutely everything. Do, do you understand? I'm not borrowing the scraps of God's table. I, he has bor everything I have is borrowed from him and it's the fullness of him. It, he, has, he has borrowed me, horrible English words, the use of it, but, 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 but yeah, but, but the concept of keeping that borrow concept, I want to, it, 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 every, everything that he is, he's going, great, I've learned it to you. You're a borrower of me. So therefore it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you understand, understand the concept here? Um, but, <laughs> and this is, again, you know, people are like, but this is too much and whatever, and, and that's okay. We need to be okay with mystery. We cannot understand God. And if you ever think you are, you need to check yourself. God, God is a God of mystery and we are called into a mysterious relationship. Not one that isn't true or isn't there, but one that's beyond our, as my granny would say, your feet more <laughs> above your understanding. It's, it's Lufthansa, as the teenagers would say, and that's okay. It, it, it's that thing of going, God, God, I, this is so out there, but you be embracing the fact of, but thank you, that you are God and I am not, that you are that big. So that when you're calling me to something that is so beyond me, I don't need to understand it because like, the point is I can't. But that doesn't mean the invitation isn't into it. Because sometimes we, if we can't, unfortunately, specifically in our context in the lives we live today, if we can't understand it or have a box for it or put it in a neat little thing, we want to throw it out the window. And God's going, no, but then you're going to throw me out the window because you, you cannot understand me. Okay. So God exalted him. He raised him from the dead. He, we ascended. We crowned him as the, the human being, um, the, the, uh, Christ, the God-man. Um, and he crowned him as king, as a preview of the coming attractions. And, and there I've put in your, I think I put it in there, um, the verse with the king of kings. Uh, yeah. Did I? Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 15. Yeah. It's God blessed, um, God the blessed and only ruler, the king of kings and the lord of lords. Who is the kings in the lower letters and the lords in the lower letters? He's the king of kings. Because sometimes we think he's the king, as you say, of the paupers or the waifs or the useless people. And God's like, no, no, no. Who, who, what do I call you here? You, he is king of... He calls us royalty. Hello. Well, we forget who we are in this deal. He, he is lord of lords. Who's the lords? Us. Who gets to co-rule and reign with him as lord in ministering his kingdom into this one? Us. Well, I always thought they meant worldly kings. Yeah, he's yeah. king and king of kings of those well, of course, as well. But in this context, yeah. he's talking yeah. about his, his people. Yeah. He is the king of kings. He is the lord of lords. Yeah? Um, and, and, and we are, we are the, 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 the planetary priesthood of the earth. In, in, I gave, gave it to you and Peter. This is, we are the royal priesthood. We are the ones who... Do you understand that a priest... <laughs> it's not like a priest is today in those days. The priest was... 
was royalty in a sense, in the sense of he, he governed and he led and he, he, was, he was one of the main leaders of the people. It was Moses and Aaron that led the people. Do, do you understand? So sometimes I think when we read this, I'm a priesthood, like, yeah, okay, okay, what does that mean? I stand up and preach sermons. That's not what it means yet. It means that, that what was the point of a priest when we did priests? What, what was their job? What was, what was their, 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 their position? <laughs> Connection between humans and God. <coughs> to serve. To, 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 their, their job was to connect with the people and, and, and take their needs to God and to connect with God and bring his, his desires to the people. But they, they great, one of their greatest jobs was that of intercession. Remember at the... At the Altar incense. Thank you. Um, and, and what is intercession? It's a word that we love bantering around as, as, um, <laughs> as Christians. Um, and, and interestingly enough, it, it says that he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, but one of his main jobs is he makes intercession for us. Because he, he stands, you remember Jesus is as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he stands in that place of leadership. He is the high priest. And we are priests under him. We are that royal priesthood. So what is that position of, of intercession? Standing in the gap. Yeah. But the veil is gone now. So. Yeah. But it, it's it's... The, 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 the very simplest, simplistic um, definition of, of intercession is, would be it, it, is me taking your hand and me taking God's hands and me bringing them together yeah. and connecting them. Yeah. That, that is, if, if I can give you the most simplest de biblical definition of intercession, it's that. It's me taking hold of, hold of you and taking hold of God and bringing the two together. And that, that you're, you're, you, you, you connect with God's destiny for you. So that's what Jesus has done. He, he's our constant intercessor. He, he is taking you by the hand and he's taking God's will by the hand and bring, bringing you, them together into your, the, 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 the true destiny for your life. So when I pray, when we intercede for people, we're not just going, you know, they're there. We're connecting them with their destiny with Jesus. How cool is that? Okay, anyway, I think I've jumped the gun, but never mind. We'll just carry on regardless. Okay, so he is the Lord of Lords, and, and, and um, we'll take dominion, and we'll rule and reign with him. Then Revelation 3.21, um, at the bottom of your page, it says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit on my throne. And are we victorious? Yep, because of Jesus, we stand in his victory. So he's talking to his children and he goes, to the one who is victorious, I eat you. I give the right to, to sit with me on the throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So we have this invitation um, to come in and to, to rule and reign with him. Um, and and so, so my destiny and your destiny is to rule and reign with Christ. My destiny is not just to make it through the week or to get my bills paid or to work out the, the junk in my life. Our destiny is to rule and reign with him, is, is, is to be part of what he wants in impacting the world. And, and God, this morning was laying stuff on my heart, and I'd really love to share this with you for this group um, in a weeks to come, but I won't do it this morning. But, but it, I really feel God is calling us as to be intercessors in this, of, of, of standing in the gap for, for people and situations and um, institutions in this world. And, and standing in the gap and actually going, I get to stand and, and, and impact this dynamic, whether it be the marketplace, whether it be media, whether it be whatever. And we get, we get to take that by the hand and join it with God's hand. You know, but we, we see God move in our prayers when we pray for the, the personal stuff, but God's going, it's bigger than that. I want to use you as, as, as to, to, to rule and reign, to, to impact the world around you um, with me and for me and for my kingdom. Everybody good? Yeah. Okay, number four in, in this picture, so we've had a resurrection, ascension, coronation, um, is, is the, the fourth one is the exaltation of, in the exaltation of Christ is the restoration of glory. We all know that, that he laid aside his glory and, and he laid aside that outward glory and he came to earth, but when he was crowned and coronated on the throne, um, he was, that robe was returned to him once again. That outward of glory, um, the, the shining forth, the... the <laughs> Very old word. The effulgence is, is an old word that was used, but that's what it is of the ancients. The effulgence of Jesus. The, 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 the fullness of his glory. The fullness of him. The radiate, the, he, he's radiating glory and splendor. Um, he, he receives back again. But remember, who's receiving this glory this time? God, man. 
So for the first time, <laughs> all of this is about the, the connection of him and the impact that, that him being man is and the connection to us. We are now in a place where we can carry his glory. Because that glory was, that effulgence, that fullness of his glory was, was reinstated back to him. That robe was put onto him. But he says, we get to wear his robe. We get to carry his glory. And we've read many scriptures over the time of this. That, 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 that this again impacts on us um, in that we get to carry him. Um, and so again, we, we look at, we, we, we carry um, all, all that he is. And number five, the role, the, the last thing of, of this, this um exaltation of God and how it's so much bigger and different. The role of our magnificent high priest, um, he is, is and he, he's a, he has the role of a magnificent high priest and magnificent intercessor. So we, we've said that. But again, we get to then stand in that place of priest and intercessor the as he was. Number five? The, the number five is he is that role of, so he, he's, he's enthroned, he's crowned, he, he's, he returned the glory, and he is now that he, he carries the position of magnificent high priest and intercessor. And again, that then becomes our positions as well. We are to be the royal priesthood. And scripturally, who's praying for us? Anybody? Yep, there's in the verse there, Hebrews 1 for us. Um, no, Hebrews 7 verse 25, um, at the top of the page. He always, this is talking about Jesus at the top of the last page. He always lives to intercede for you. The other person that intercedes for us is? Spirit. Yep, there's another verse that talks about the Spirit is continually interceding for you. So out of the three of the, the Godhead, two-thirds is praying for you and God the Father is answering. So quite frankly... You're covered. <laughs> if Jesus and the Holy Spirit are interceding for you and God is, 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 is empowering that and answering that, you are in a good place. But that invites us into that of going, so with that knowledge, we get to pray. We get to intercede. We as that royal priesthood and intercessor get to pray and to change and to rule and reign to change the dynamic that we're called to. Yeah? When we intercede for somebody, should they know it? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay, so Jesus had this passion to pray. And therefore, we should have a passion to pray um, and to connect. And as I said, we are given that role of, of priest and, and, and the duty and responsibility as priest, that we are to bring people to God and to take them by the hand with a person and the other hand with God and to link them um, into the realm of purpose, into their realm of purpose and destiny. Okay, so that's, 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 that's that just going back to that first, first um, verses in the beginning. That's that God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. That was for, so you could understand why... Why would this multi, this grace, this, this this glory be exalted? Why would it be greater than the first time around? But it's greater because it's completely different and it carries all of us. It's not just about him. It's it's about us as well. Okay, everybody happy with that? So now we're gonna, we've got we did the seven steps down. Why this is so different? Now we're going to take the seven steps from the throne, from from the cross. Sorry, to to the Jesus goes taking up to the throne. Okay, so let's just I want to read verses. Um, 9 and 10, it says, because of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the, given the greatest of all names. Verse 10, the authority of the name of Jesus causes every knee to bow in reverence. Everything and everyone will one day submit to, to the name in the heavenly realm, in the earthly realm, and in the demonic realm. And every tongue will proclaim in every language, Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh, bringing glory and honor to God his Father. Okay? So let's look at number one. Number one, um, as, as we, we're looking to that, is, is right in the beginning, we did, he, he exalted him. That was number one. In the step up, God exalted him. And we've unpacked that into the five points, but that's step number one. Everybody good? Mm -hmm. Step number two, he has been given the name, the greatest of all names. Now, we understand that his name is greater than others, but there's a, that's the literal meaning, of course. But there is a, a, a metaphorical meaning. What does it mean if, if you've got the name above all names? What does that mean? It's about? Greatness. Yeah. Another word for that would be sovereignty. He, if he's got the name above all names, he's sovereign. There's no one bigger and no one greater than him. So it's, it's a, about his sovereignty, that he is now sovereign, and that the entire universe now revolves around him. He is that linchpin. He is, is the center. We sing that. We saw it in Revelation. He is the one that sits in the throne in the center and everything else revolves around that. Mm. 
He, 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 him having the name above all names is not just that his name is great. It's na na his name is sovereign. It is the kingpin that holds everything else. Yeah? Um, so that is, that is that next step. And he is going to govern the cosmos um, from that place. So he's a, we, number one, he is a, God exalted him. Number two, he was given the greatest name above all. And number three is his authority will cause every knee to bow. Now, we understand, again, there's a literal thing of, of every knee bowing that he is God. And we, when we worship him and, and we, we honor him and we, we, we pray, we, we do that. And in, in our hearts and in our worships, we, we bow and we, we, and we bow our knee to him. But again, there's a metaphorical thing that I think we understand that every knee shall bow is a thing of submission. Mm -hmm. Submission and obedience to God. The implication here is that we don't just sing a song of worship, but that we obey the king as sovereign, as he is it. So every knee will bow means God, <laughs> I, 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 you know, it's a place of dare we res resist his will. He is exalted on high and yet we do. How dare we stop when he says go? How, how dare we, when he says speak, how dare we keep quiet? Do you understand the concept? It's a submission of if he is if he is sovereign, if he is above all, and I and, and he, he's calling every knee to bow. He's going, hey guys. Th then it's then it's about me, and it's about submission and obedience to me. And, and it's about doing and and being and saying what he he calls us to do when he when he calls us to do it. Does that make sense? Um. Because that, that's that place of giving him lordship in my life means that's the position he holds. If he is lord, means he's sovereign, means he gets to call it, that every knee shall bow, that there is submission and obedience. Are we good? But in the end as well, those that don't yep. bow the knee now to God. And yet that's submission. We either submit to him being as Lord as our, our yes. Lord, or we don't. Yeah. And, and you're right. In the end, he's going. He's going. Every knee will bow because every knee, everyone will see that he is sovereign. Yes. But by that time, it'll be too. It late may be too late. Yeah. Um, and so there, there is no one thing that is going to to pull from my heart the affection and the worship of Jesus because he holds that place. Mm -hmm. No one else can. Mm -hmm. You know, and he that place is there because he bled to death for me. He gave up his godness for me, became man for me, became vulnerable to be pierced for me. And we go, well, why should I? <laughs> because he's done everything that you should. Not that he had to prove himself, but he did. Um, and in every way, he, he, he gave up his blood and his body so that we could, and he became the ultimate sacrifice, so that we could receive everything that was his. It's an incredible mystery again, but an incredible privilege. That we, you know, like, I don't think we understand that incarnation, you know, we talk about the incarnation at Christmas time, but I don't think just because we celebrate Christmas, we really understand the incarnation of Jesus at all. But so, so there is, is this, 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 what it really means for Jesus, he came and he, the incarnation was that emptying of himself. He became human. He became man as a baby in a stable. Um, and he emptied himself and became savior. And now this path of self-emptying is the path of unity and humility that we are called. Do you understand? We go back again of going, so how did he lead? He came by dying, by emptying, by, by being humble. And, and, and to live out the life he's called me to, I need to live in submission to him, in humility to him, and into the fullness that he's done for us. Yeah, we good? So again, he's that perfect model. He's the example, the supreme example of how we can adopt and embrace the model of Christ and that we should submit and live as he submitted his life and lived in obedience to God. Okay, number four. Everyone in the heaven will bow to God, to the God man. And you go, yeah, okay. And that is the concept of that in your verse. It's that... Um, Yes, that they all, the, 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 every knee shall bow in tongue, but it's that everyone, and then it, in heavenly realms, in the earthly realms, in demonic realms. But it, it, it's important to understand that what that looks like, um, that everyone in heaven will bow, bow to the God man. Do you understand that before that the angels had never done that? 
Can you imagine? Just, just, just think about this for the angels for a minute. The angels had worshipped God, had lived with the, the seeing and, and understanding the full glory of God. They, they, they were around the throne. They had seen God. In fact, the ones that got closest to him were called the seraphim. They were called the burning ones because they got so close to his presence, they ignited. So they, they understood the full glory, the weighty glory of, 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 of who God was. Yeah. So, so they, they, they understand it. They see it. They understand humans them um, that they get to serve but suddenly this this god that they've served this this you know being that is above all and when they get so close they ignite with his glory comes and they watch him become a baby and take on human form and god engages with him with them as father and child i am their father they are my children and so suddenly there is this dynamic that changes even for the angels in the worshiping of going, sure, you know, we, we, we worship this being who looked a certain way and now there's this. So have a look at some of those scriptures. I, I think I gave it to you in Hebrews 1.5. For which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Or again, I will be your father and you shall be my son. Psalm 2 verse 7. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son and I have become your father. So, so there's this, there is this picture where they had never ever worshipped anything vaguely man. And now Jesus goes back to the throne as God man. So even their worship changes. Do you understand that? That every knee will bow. And this is the first time that that in heaven and on earth, and it explains on earth, the, the angelic and the demonic, because it had never happened before. The angels had never worshipped a God man. Well, we don't understand what a cataclysmic shift that was for all of eternity on every level. Does that make sense? Am I, have I lost you there? Um, so, because again, he didn't leave humanity on the earth. He took humanity to the skies. And now the angels are commanded to worship a man that is God-man, 200% man, you know, 100% God, 100% man. And guess what? We are made in his image. Um, and we get, we are mingled, dust and deity like him. And the throne is waiting for you. The overcomers will arise, and as we've read. And the throne is now going to be shared with you, and your destiny is to rule with him. And you are being prepared as his bride, as we are being made ready as his co-equal partner, sharing the throne, ruling the universe with Jesus Christ. Again, that, that picture that we get to, to, to rule and reign with him. Everything in heaven is going to bow to the God-man. Okay, number five. And every demonic being will bow to him as well. Every aberrant authority, every rebellious power is going, going to be subdued and is commanded to obey Jesus Christ. And because Christ is in you, guess what? They, they have to bow to your authority. Not to the authority, my authority, but the authority, the borrowed authority I stand in. God's authority. That's why the Bible says, I, 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 he is, God has put Satan under my feet. Because I'm strong and victorious? No, but because Jesus is. And I stand in the fullness of Jesus. I stand in his borrowed authority. Remember, I have the armor of God. Remember, we, we, we did that with, we, we've put that on. We've borrowed his, and we now get to stand, and he sees us in him, as him. So even, even the, 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 the demonic needs to bow. And again, it reflects on us. That's where we stand. We get to stand in that position of his, not because of who we are, in the sense of what I've done or I'm so powerful or whatever. The authority I stand in is his authority. But best I know it. Stand in it and not move. Does that make sense? Is that all our friends going? It feels like everybody's ringing at the same time. It's all of us. <laughs> it's like it's the fun. Okay. Does that make sense? Because sometimes we're scared by the demonic. But I don't face the demonic. It's the thing of who am I standing in? Christ in me. Who whose authority? Whose victory? Jesus's. 
And sometimes I, I think we, 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 we short change because we don't stand in that authority. We, we let the, the demonic and we let Satan have more influence in our lives than he's allowed. Because I allow it. Do you, do you understand? The only thing that, that, that Satan can do, he, he's defeated, but the only access he has for, for you is what you allow. Which is really annoying. <coughs> Because we realize how much, how many times we come into agreement. Because he's subtle, he's cunning. Oh, you just junk. Open the door. Make agreement. Yes, I'm junk. You've just listened to him and given him authority. Exactly what Adam and, what happened with Eve, Eve in the garden. She gave him authority. He took her authority away. She had the authority of God. Satan made her doubt it and she gave it up. And he took it away. We need to be very careful about the things that we manage because we are victorious. We get to stand in his authority and they should bow. But the minute I listen to that rubbish and I open that door and I give it a foothold and I give it, the, I give it access, it has legal tender to be there because I've given it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So sometimes I need to sit and go, God, I'm sorry, I've opened that door and I've made an agreement with that and I need to break that agreement with that thought, with that mm -hmm. thing in my life, with that fear, with that whatever. Mm -hmm. I need to break agreement and choose again to stand in agreement with you and what, what is mine in you. That, that is what we do at Sozo. That's what we do in spiritual healing because that's the concept. We, we, we take on stuff that isn't ours because we forget this. Okay, so as I said, we, it's, it's borrowed authority, but we get to enforce the victory because we stand in His. Um, and, and we don't enforce our will, we enforce the victory of the sovereign king that we worship. So every demonic being will bow to the God-man that we stand in. Yeah? Okay. Let's go to verse 11. I just want to read that again. And every tongue will proclaim in every language that Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh, bringing glory and honor to God the Father. Um, so we see that the next step forward and upward is that number six, every tongue will proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh. I always remembered it because of the Boeing connotation, but 747, 747 times um, in, in the New Testament, Jesus is called Lord. 747 times. And the Greek word in scripture that he used for, for, for Lord is kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S. But it's, <laughs> I, I, it's not the greatest word. In the sense of, in Greek, kurios means Lord, but it also means um, a de it also can be used for demons, noblemen and merchants, um, and landowners, wealthy landowners. So, so, so it's sort of a very generic word in Greek. But if you go read it in the Aramaic, um, the Aramaic is, is, is a very beautiful way. And the word Lord there is the word that is, um, is, is Lord Yahweh. And that's why they've in, he, he's done that, made that line in the thing. It's, it is... is the word for Lord is the ultimate lordship, Yahweh, in that word. Um, and so it gives us a truer picture of what's at place here. He's not just going to be called Lord. Oh, he's another one that we, you know, as the Muslims see it as, he's just another good teacher or good prophet. He's not just a Lord, another nobleman, wise, wise man. That's not, because that's the connotation in the Greek. In the Aramaic, he is Lord Yahweh. He, he, he is God. He is Lord. Capital L. And that's why often in, in scripture, where, where in the Old Testament, you'll see Yahweh, with, uh, Lord, with a capital L. In the Hebrew, it would be Yahweh. Um, so, so that's the word that is used for this Lord. Um, so where it says that, and that's why he's, he's translated it, Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh. Um, and we know that that word Yahweh is, is um, it's a called the Tetragrammaton. Not that anybody needs to know that. A big words like jam. But we know that it was, it was such a sacred word. That, that, do you know, I don't know if you know this, but in ancient Hebrew, that when the Jewish people wrote the name, they broke the pen or the scribe that they wrote the name with every time they wrote it, because it was so sacred. They couldn't, they couldn't use that pen again or that, that inscription um, thing. It, it, is, it is a word, and it's, it, Hebrew is an interesting language. Hebrew, ancient Paleo-Hebrew, do you know they had no vowels in until the 8th century AD? So, so it only had 7,500, 75,000 words which is very little for a language. 
and hence why it's a it's a um what is the movie always talking about it's a uh mid and end that word um, it, it, homonym. In other words, they are, one word means many things because it's, it's limited words. And, and that came, you see it more when it comes into to, to play in the 8th century where they start adding the vowels. And of course, it's written the other way. But the reality is, is that it, because it's, it, the words have many means, meanings in Hebrew, and so it's, it's, a, it's a beautifully complex language. But this word Yahweh was a big one. And I know... Um, we have sent out that clip about Yahweh and the numbers and what it stands for and just, just the beauty of God's word and God's name. One of the most awesome things in Hebrew was their understanding. I, one of the, the, the rabbis was, was talking about how for them it's, it's, it's the word that means the essence of life. Um, it, 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 the, the, it's yod he vah he is the, the letters of the, and I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. Yod he vah he. Thank you. Um, better pronunciation. But it, it, for them it's the sound of breathing, breathing in and out. So it's the breath of life that, that, that is the understanding of, of God. He's the essence of life, the breath of life. Um, and even that sound of breathing, it, it, it is this beautiful um, name. And the Jewish people obviously used it, viewed it as hugely sacred. But that is the name that Jesus has. But when you breathe, that's what you do. You go... Exactly. And that's the thing. The, the, the sound, as you say, it would be the sound of breathing. And so it, it, even Jesus, God's name is the, the essence of life. The, and he breathed life into us in, in the beginning. But there's, so it's this beautiful picture of, 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 of God being the center. But now this picture, what we're reading in, in, in Philippians, is telling us that Jesus is, the, is God. Do you understand the connotation here? So that every time when we see, it, it's implied that every time we see Yahweh in the Old Testament, we see Jesus. And he is the fullness of, 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 he is the Lord. He is Lord Yahweh, the, the Lord Jehovah, um, that, that we worship. And so, so, so <laughs> it's not just Lord as in there's someone over us. It is the essence of life. He is God, Lord of all, that, that we get to do life in and with. And that's why it says Jesus, and in every language we proclaim, Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh. He's not just someone who is of authority, but he is Lord, as in God himself which makes a big difference than just going oh well he's lord um, especially in our context and understanding of that are we good everybody understand mm -hmm. jesus mm -hmm. kind of talks about that when he See you. makes that statement yeah i am your truth yep yeah. um and it's so, so it's, it's just because sometimes we we segment this where god's going we've got rules but the godhead is the godhead and jesus is the pinnacle i have placed him there he is sovereign he, he is, he, when, I re, when, when I put him on the throne, that's the position I gave him, was sovereign over the universe. Everything else now revolves around him. He's not less than. It's not God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in less than. God, has, God has, has, has placed him in this position because he is now the, 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 the sovereign of, of, of the cosmos. Um, and, that is the, and then we are seated with him. In heaven. Like, like that's where your brain starts to starts to explode. The, the interesting thing is, by definition then, who made Jesus Lord? The Father. Who made Jesus Lord? God did. So this whole thing of, I made Jesus Lord of my life, love you, but he's always been. <laughs> God made Jesus Lord of all. Do I need to submit to that? Yes. Do you know, I need to accept that and open myself up to that and, and bow to that, yes. But trust me, I didn't make him Lord. That is, God did. God lifted him up. Um, and he is Lord Yahweh. And the world will proclaim that. Every tongue will proclaim. And when it talks about every tongue, it is implied human, angel, and demon. Because it's everything that, that, that speaks. Mm -hmm. And in creation, those are the three things. Um, so so there, there, there's that submission and that sovereignty is, not, is understood across the board. It's not, well, some people will think he is Lord. Or some, you know, man will, but, you know, the demons won't. Oh, no. He is Lord, done, dusted. And every, every mouth will proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Lord Yahweh. We good? What number did we get to? We six, that was six. six. Okay. So 
So we, we get to this place now where God exalts Jesus. Um, but he is exalted because he humbled himself. And that's what we see. The seven steps down. And this, this statement, I, I just want to... If you go through the totality of Scripture, the teaching, the, the, the teaching of spirituality, summed up, will be summed up, of, especially of the New Testament, can be summed up in one phrase. Humble yourself and you will be exalted. Exalt yourself and you will be humbled. If you, if you take the whole of the New Testament, the spiritual phrase is that, because that's what Jesus is teaching us. Humble yourself to what is obviously what it unpacks, but that's, that's the line. Humble yourself and you will be exalted. Exalt yourself and you will be humble. Mm. And, and it's one that we throw around. I mean, even non-Christians use those lines, let's be honest. And yet that is the crux of the New Testament. That's the picture of Jesus. He humbled himself so God could exalt him. And he calls us to humble ourselves so God can exalt us. And he goes, the minute you start to exalt yourself and think, I can do it. Is there anything we can do in our own strength? Mm -mm. No. Who, does I, who do I boast in? Never in me. I boast in him. I can do things, but not in my own strength. I can do things because of Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But it's got nothing to do with me. The minute I think I, I, I can deal with this, or God, I can sort this out, I can, I can navigate the junk in my heart, or I can love that person with my strength, I promise you, you're going to come short. Because we can't. I can't even love my enemies in my own strength. Can't. I can't deal with the junk in my heart in my own strength. Can't. Can I deal with it all in God's strength? Of course I can. But that's the dynamic here of, of to walk with God, I've got to let go. I've got to die to me. Dying to self. You're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You're in Christ. It's the concept of humble yourself and you will be exalted. It's the essence of the New Testament is humility. And yet, that's, this concept is not that big in churches anymore. Humility is one of those... The last thing he showed us was washing... The yeah, blood. it was massive for him. Yeah. And everything about him, his life, everything, think about him, the God of the universe, everything about his life was humbling. He had everything at his disposal. He was worshipped by everything and he was spat on and mistreated and misunderstood and even by his own flippin' guys that stuck with him was deserted and whatever. He, did you understand? Like the whole picture of Jesus was going, I am the ultimate picture of humility and I am your example. Offense? No. Status? No. Your own strength? No, because I'm completely obedient to what I do. What the Father says to me to do. We are called to a life of humility, which doesn't necessarily look like a monk or a nun, but it looks like Jesus. That's the point. My life looks like emptying myself, walking humbly with him in complete obedience and submission to him, which is how Jesus lived. And God says, and then I can lift you up. But the minute you exalt yourself, you are going to fall. And so we don't even often see it as exalting. I'm just like, no, no, God, I'll sort that out. <coughs> You're not in charge of you. You cannot do it. Even forgiveness, real forgiveness, I cannot do it on my own. I do it because it's, Jesus does it in me and he gives me the ability to forgive. Because otherwise there's always an attachment. Mine is always, I'll love if, I'll forgive if, I will, you know. And Jesus is like, no. It's this, 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 this thing of humility is massive because a lot of our problems come when we won't humble ourselves. Remember the rich young ruler? He was doing everything right. What was the one thing missing? We can be doing everything wrong, but God says it's the condition of your heart. I look at your heart. You can serve, but you're not serving out of humility unto me. Yeah. Do you hear what I'm saying? You don't uh, always do realize that or actively think I'm serving because I'm serving. Yeah, God. no, we don't I think about that. And so sometimes we really need to sit down to God and that's where I, like I, I try to do it really is go, God, where have things got out of line? What am I doing that's in my own strength? 
and not in yours? What, what am I doing that we have opened an agreement and what am I doing because I'm thinking, well, about, it's actually about the fear of man and what people think, not you. And, and again, when I'm doing, I don't think of those things. But when I sit down, I need to often need to reevaluate and go, oh, sorry. That was done out of pride because it's fear of man. And I need to let it go. Or I need to walk away. Or I need to whatever. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, it, it, it affects the grassroots of our life and how we live it. Um, in everything. Okay. I lost. Sorry. Let's grab another one of these. Um, Okay, number seven. So in our lives, God plus nothing needs to be our motto. We empty ourselves of our pride and we take the lowest place, like a river, and be okay with being unseen and un unheard, but because it's all about him and for him. And that's, that's what it comes to. Am I doing what it, in my day and in my life and what I choose to do? Am I doing it for him unto him? And the number seven would be that God received the glory and honor of sharing his throne. So, so um, if you read, and every, and every tongue will proclaim in every language, Jesus Christ is Lord, bringing glory and honor to God, his Father. And so again, um, that God received the glory and honor of sharing his throne with a man. Because Jesus Christ gave God glory and honor. And he brought glory and honor to God. So that the exaltation of Christ meant that God received glory and honor from sharing the throne with this God man. Again, that's what made it different all the way through. That this glory was different because it was shared with a man. And all of this because he humbled himself and was obedient unto death. Verse 12. My beloved ones. Just like you've always listened to everything I've taught you in the past, I'm asking you now to keep following my instructions as though I were right there with you. Now you must continue to make this new life fully manifested as you live um, in the holy awe of God, which brings you trembling into his presence. A lot of words there. But what he's doing is he's unpacking. Go to the bottom, the NIV section, to the last verse. And, and what he's doing is that he's unpacking the line that I've highlighted. It says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, if we re read that verse of what does it mean to work out our salvation? And again, we need to be careful because we don't work for our salvation. We don't earn our salvation by works. So what is he saying here? And so that's where he's unpacked it. And he says, this is he's him unpacking that line. It says, now you must continue to make this new life. This humble life, this submitted life, this life of, of, of becoming less so that you can become, this life of living the example of Jesus, okay? Now you must continue to make this new life fully manifest. In other words, so that it is seen. So that others see Jesus in me. Not in some fancy glory way, but in the way that he chose to live. Humbly, submitted to God, obedient. I get to live that way. Um, so that it make this life, new life manifest um, as you live in the holy awe of God, which brings you trembling into his presence. It's about him. It's all about him. It's quite hard because Jesus, you know, just by becoming a man, not just, but I mean by becoming a man, he was humbling himself. Yeah. We're already men. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So to humble ourselves, it's hard to see what that looks like. Yeah. And biblically... So this is where it smuggles with the brain a bit. Because biblically, humbling ourselves would mean behaving like Jesus. Mm -hmm. So according to human status, sometimes that looks like arrogance and pride. It does, you see, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because biblically, the definition of humility is being fully who God created me to be. And pride is living in any way other than God didn't create me to be. So me smacking my, on myself on the back going, oh, I'm not worth anything. That is not humility biblically, that's pride. Which, which we go, what? But it is, because, because it's me thinking of myself in a way that is other than God thinks of me. Does that make sense? So, so, so humility would be going, God, I have authority and I need to use it. Show me how to use that. Let me stop worrying about what people think and going, well, she's going to be big stuff now because she's going to stand up and pray or she's going to stand up and declare healing over you or whatever. But God, this is, this is, I'm humbling myself to, to take on that which you've called me to be, to be like Christ and live it out regardless of what everybody else thinks. Because that's where the dying to self comes. 
because the world's going to see it as arrogance at moments, especially the, the church, <laughs> sorry, which was Jesus. Who are these his biggest critics? The Pharisees. And yet, the humbling and self, everything Jesus did was in humility and obedience to God. And so, yep, it's going to look very different. But God's like, when you live that way, and, and we need to be careful. I can exalt you. And we're going, but I, I don't do it about the exaltation. Because that's our immediate head goes. And he goes, no, <laughs> you don't understand. The exaltation of you means people see me. So I have to be exalted in your life. Hum humility is not, you know, going, oh God, don't, don't give me the glory because it's all yours. He's like, I know that, but you carry it to this world. So if it's not on you, they don't see it. So we, we've got to get over ourselves about this, but God wants to glorify us. Because how do we sit in the position of co-ruling and reigning and standing in his authority when I've rejected the glory? Does this make sense? Yes. Who does she think she is? Exactly. And God goes, I know who she is. She's me on earth. She's my hands. She's my feet. She's standing up. And often we'll look at people through history. And, and funny enough, when they die, we think of them better often. But when they were, were, were alive and living and ministering to God, people often refer to them, especially the Christians, as arrogant or, as, you know, whatever. And yet God used them mightily. Why? Because they didn't care what anybody else felt. They did what God did. And sometimes what God asked them to do was weird and wonderful. Pray for the dead. And yo, we have a lot to say. Until it's our person lying on the, on the morgue. <laughs> platter and we want you to find one of those who has the faith enough to, do you understand what I'm saying so 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 this this we, that is maybe what we need to go and pray this week is this this humbling ourselves and exalting ourselves that we would see it as God intended it not as the world it does mm -hmm. that humbling ourselves means I I take on the example of Christ in every way acknowledging who I am in him, living from him, and then accepting the, the exaltation of, of who God called us to be, of, of living out the fullness of him so that he is seen. If I, everything I have is borrowed, it's so not my glory. It's his. But if I don't stand up with that robe of glory in the place that he intended me to be, no one is going to encounter it. And that's the way we need to live. Yeah? Lots to think about and pray about, but important stuff. So, Father, thank you for, again, just opening things to us. And, and God, where, where oh, the, the world mindset and your mindset seems to clash, and we've got this mingle mousse in our head. Lord, we pray for you to come and to, to, to wipe away that which is not you. Show us what it is to walk humbly with you as you becoming like you. And what it is to carry your glory in a way that we stand in your authority and we deal with that which you call us to do as we co rule and reign with you. Thank you, God, that we can ask for that spirit of wisdom and that spirit of revelation. Won't you come, Holy Spirit, and minister to this to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.